The year is 2350 BC. The funeral of a pharaoh named Unas. But this is not a day of mourning, it's a celebration. For 3,000 years, the Egyptians clung to a cherished belief in the resurrection of the human spirit. Today, the soul of the pharaoh is being reborn, but the journey into the afterlife is not without its obstacles. These magic spells will guarantee a safe passage. The Pharaoh's quest for eternity would inspire the most colossal monuments ever built in antiquity. The Pyramids of Giza, near modern Cairo, are the world's most enduring testament to time. The oldest and the largest is the Great Pyramid. For over 4,000 years, it was the tallest man-made structure on Earth. Built of limestone, it's estimated that over three million blocks were quarried and hoisted into place, some weighing up to 15 tons apiece. The sheer wonder and perfection of the pyramids led Western travelers to speculate on who really built them and why. No mortal, and certainly no ancient Egyptian, could raise such immense stones. Was it the creator himself to conceal his divine plan for the universe? Or was it the fabled civilization of Atlantis to house their ancient wisdom? Perhaps visitors from outer space? But what self-proclaimed experts and mystics failed to observe was that the pyramids at Giza were not isolated phenomena. From Cairo to Aswan, 650 miles south along the Nile Valley, scores of pyramids dot the landscape. Most the final resting place of the pharaohs and their queens and most inexorably linked to the search for immortality. In ancient Egypt, the concept of the pyramid had its origins at the dawn of time. In the beginning, there was darkness and a formless ocean of chaos. Out of it arose a mound on this mound appeared the sun god, Ra, the embodiment of all life and energy, all light and warmth. Ra crossed the sky. Then at sunset, he plunged back into the chaotic abyss, only to be reborn the next morning at sunrise. 
the Egyptians hoped that by uniting their spirits with the sun god, they too could be swept into the cycle of eternal life. The pyramid was the vehicle to immortality, the resurrection machine. Seen as the mound of creation, it was part of an elaborate process conceived to assist the pharaoh on his journey to the afterlife. But no two pyramids were alike. Written on the walls of King Unis's tomb is a virtual guide to immortality. Called the Pyramid Texts, it's filled with arcane formulas and spells. One to rid the Pharaoh of all wrongdoings, a soul full of sin can't go to heaven. One to protect him from scorpions and snakes he might encounter along the way. One to announce his arrival to the sun god, Ra. Unis's tomb presents an extraordinary vision of the afterlife, a self-contained resurrection machine. It was born out of the soil and psyche of the Egyptian people. But until now, the true story of the pyramids would remain as obscure as those who built them. Towering over an ancient cemetery at Saqqara, some 10 miles south of Cairo, is Egypt's first pyramid. Called the Step Pyramid, it's also the first tall structure ever built in stone. Dedicated to the resurrection of King Djoser in 2610 BC, the Step Pyramid was something new. Before, the Egyptians had built their monuments of mud brick and wood. But here, not just a pyramid, but an entire complex of chapels and courtyards had been rendered for eternity in imperishable stone. The mastermind behind Joseph's complex was the king's minister and architect, Imhotep. A scholar and self-made man, his achievement earned him the title of vizier, the highest official in the land. Later, the Egyptians would even worship him as a saint. But recently, a new discovery far south of Saqqara, at the Royal Cemetery at Abydos, has raised the specter of who the true genius behind the resurrection machine really was. Here, 500 years before the arrival of the pyramid, the first kings of Egypt were buried under low rectangular mounds of sand and gravel. Since 1995, Günther Dreyer of the German Archaeological Institute and his team have been excavating the tomb of King Kasakemui, who ruled Egypt in 2680 BC. The largest royal tomb at Abydos, it was filled with underground chambers fit for a king. The tomb is uh, built in sun-dried mud bricks. It has about 65 chambers, and its whole length is about 200 feet. The chambers were covered by means of uh, wooden beams uh, and uh, matwork and above layers of mud brick. The large tomb pit was filled uh, with sand 
and above desert level there was a large mound, massive mound of sand and rubble. The mound, called by Egyptologists a mastaba, echoed the primordial mound of creation, the symbol of rejuvenation. Half a mile away on the edge of the desert, Kasakimbui also built a massive rectangular enclosure. Over 35 feet high and nearly 400 feet long, it's one of the oldest standing structures in the world made of brick. For decades, scientists thought it was a military fort. Locals thought it was the storehouse of Joseph who predicted seven fat years and seven lean in the Bible. but they now know it was the Pharaoh's Palace of Eternity. For archeologist David O'Connor of New York's Institute of Fine Art, it's also a marvel of ancient engineering. Although this uh, huge enclosure was built almost 5,000 years ago, it was built in a very, on a very massive scale and very, very soundly, so an extraordinary amount of it has still survived to today. And as a result, we're really able to reconstruct what it originally would have looked like. For example, every, every external face had this uh, series of recessed panels in it with a buttress and a recess and then another panel. Uh, these were plastered heavily with uh, mud plaster uh, and then painted white uh, so that instead of uh, simply great blank white walls rising about 30 or 40 feet high, uh, you had uh, walls across the faces of which there was an ever-changing pattern of light and shade throughout the day as the sun moved around the monument. The walls are a replica of those surrounding the king's actual palace and courtyard. The panels, an emblem of power. In life, the courtyard was a stage for the pageantry and ceremony of ancient Egypt. In death, a testament to faith in continuity. Kasakimui's enclosure was the largest of several built at Abydos. But the king had more ambitious plans. In search of the perfect resurrection machine, he would become the first great builder in Egyptian history. In the shadow of the Step Pyramid at Saqqara, Ian Matheson of the National Museum of Scotland is investigating a mystery that has puzzled archaeologists for years. Using a remote sensing device developed for oil exploration, he's investigating a landmark known as Gizr el Mudir, which means the enclosure of the boss. And that's us over the other side of the wall now. 39.2. In the 1940s, an aerial photograph revealed the outline of an immense stone structure almost a half a mile long and nearly a quarter mile wide. On the surface, only a few sections of the wall remain. This is the inside of the wall on the north wall and it stretches from this here over to the horizon where you can see about 15 meters wide at this point here made of local limestone then the wall continues to the end and the whole width of the uh, enclosure is about 350 meters from this side across to the other and about 650 meters over the sight line you can see just now the south wall is over the horizon The actual size of the enclosure is almost twice the size of the Zosa pyramid enclosure. It is an amazing construction because if you look at the size of it, is, it must have been the largest stone construction that anyone could put up at that time in history, which is about four and a half thousand years ago. Pottery found at the site indicates the enclosure may predate King Joseph's by 25 years, 
making it the oldest monumental building ever erected entirely of stone. If so, who built it? Only King Kasakimui had the skill to make a more permanent bid for immortality. But no one could prove it until Günther Dreyer made an exciting new discovery at Abydos. During our excavation, we found lots of seal impressions with inscriptions. And astonishingly, among them were several ones with the name of King Djoser. And from this we may conclude that Djoser buried Kazahimui and must have been his immediate successor. This is quite important for the understanding of the development of the royal tomb. The revelation that Djoser succeeded Kazahimui filled in a long-standing gap in Egyptian history. Egyptologists knew that Djoser was Kazakemui's stepson, but other contenders were vying for the throne. The seals not only confirmed the succession, now for the first time archaeologists could trace the evolution of the pyramid from its infancy. Borrowing on his father's grand scheme for the afterlife, King Djoser then took it one step further. When Djoser built his tomb, he decided to bring the two elements, tomb and large and closer, together. But what happened? He built his tomb shaft, the chamber, and above the mound, the initial mastaba. And then the enclosure wall was built around it. But now, the important mound was no longer visible. To solve this problem, they built several smaller mastabas on top of the first one. And they were quite visible over the enclosure wall. And so, we have a step pyramid there. A staircase to heaven is laid for him, that he may ascend it to the sky, says one of the oldest fragments of Egyptian writing. The journey from a simple dirt mound to the world's first pyramid sprang from a powerful vision of the hereafter, one that would inexorably alter the landscape of Egypt. Although the next few attempts at pyramid building failed, the monument at Saqqara would inspire another dreamer to reach for the stars. This odd-looking ruin near the village of Medum, some 50 miles south of Cairo, marked the beginning of a new chapter in the evolution of pyramids. The only full-size step pyramid completed after King Joseph's, it's also the last one like it ever built. Called the False Pyramid in Arabic, it eventually collapsed as the result of ancient stone robbing. but not before the remarkable man behind it had already decided to try something different. Snefru was revered as a benevolent and good-humoured king, a true visionary, he would become Egypt's greatest pyramid builder. For him, Medum was just the beginning. Moving north to Dashur, Snefru built two more monuments.
what is now known as the Bent Pyramid, would have surpassed the Great Pyramid of Giza if the builders had kept to their plans. But halfway through construction, it began to crack. Rainer Stadelmann of the German Archaeological Institute is an expert on King Snefu's projects. Allowed unprecedented access to the pyramid, he now knows exactly what went wrong. This is a major crack. Many of these cracks happened during the construction of the pyramid because it was built on a weak ground. The king and his architects were very worried and unhappy about this. Uh, they even tried to reduce uh, the angle of the pyramid, creating so the appearance of the bent pyramid. But finally, nothing could be done. The pyramid had to be abandoned. The pyramid had been erected on a sandy plain without a solid foundation. Eventually, it began to subside. To stabilize it, the builders changed the slope from 54 to 43 degrees, hoping to reduce its weight. But it was too late. Two miles away, Snefru launched his third and final pyramid. Quick to learn from their mistakes, the king's architects laid a foundation of limestone to prevent subsidence and settled on an angle of 43 degrees, the same as the top of the Bent Pyramid. Called the Red Pyramid for the glowing color of the local limestone, it's the first true geometric pyramid and Egypt's fourth tallest. Snefru could now ascend to heaven on a ramp that gleamed like the rays of the sun. The pyramid is entered by a long descending passageway three feet square. At the bottom are three interconnected chambers, each over 40 feet high and each with a distinctive corbelled ceiling. Designed to support the weight of the pyramid above, they resemble a step pyramid in reverse. Pyramid within a pyramid not only reinforced the structure, the Egyptians believed it doubled the king's chances for resurrection. With this sequence of three large and high rooms, uh, King Snofru finally had achieved a burial place, an eternal residence he could be happy and content with. These rooms are constructed of large limestone blocks. Uh, the roof in layers of limestone blocks, everyone protruding about 15 centimeters. With this Ingenious construction, uh, the mass of the pyramid resting on it could be supported. There are about two, more than two million tons of stone on these rooms. But there's no crack and no danger in it. The roof represents religiously also the sky uh, resting over the wooden sarcophagus in which King Snofru rested for eternity.
one of Reiner Stadelman's most important discoveries at Dashur would finally answer two age-old questions. Who actually built the pyramids and how long did it take? When we started excavation here, we found a part of the casing still preserved. Other blocks had been fallen. On the reverse of these blocks, we found the name of the working gangs who constructed the pyramid. For example, the green one in Egyptian, Wachet, the name of the king, King Snofru, and dates. With these dates, we could uh, realize that after two years, already six layers of the pyramid have been constructed. Two years later, uh, about 15 meters uh, of the pyramid has been completed. And from another date, we learn that it took about 17 years to construct the whole pyramid. To build his pyramids, Snefru would quarry more stone and harness more manpower than any other pharaoh during the Old Kingdom. But his successor would concentrate his energy on one, the greatest resurrection machine of them all. Rising from the Giza Plateau is the ultimate expression of the quest for eternity. Built for Snefru's successors, Khufu, Kafra, and Menkaura, they are virtually man-made mountains. The superhuman scale of the Great Pyramid alone earned Khufu the reputation of a cruel tyrant. It contained enough stone to build a wall three feet high around the whole of France, according to Napoleon, who marveled at it in 1798. Time has been kinder to the pyramid of King Khafra. Only two feet smaller than the Great Pyramid, it's better preserved. The original limestone facing still decorates the summit. It also retains the remnants of several structures that were an integral part of the resurrection machine. At the base of the pyramid was a mortuary temple supplied with daily offerings of food and drink in the belief that even a dead king needed sustenance. From there, a covered causeway almost a third of a mile long led to a valley temple, a monumental portal linking the desert plateau to the life-giving and purifying waters of the Nile. But Kafra added something new to the traditional pyramid complex. The Sphinx one of Egypt's most haunting images. A sprawling lion with the head of a man, it reaches across time to proclaim the king, master of the world. On a journey to Egypt in 450 BC, the Greek historian Herodotus was told the pyramids were built by slaves. But all evidence of their existence seemed to vanish without a trace until American archaeologist Mark Lehner began mapping the Giza Plateau. Since then, he's uncovered proof that far from a labor camp, Giza was once a thriving community of workers the size of a small city dedicated to serving the kings. South of the pyramids, a stone wall separates the tombs and temples of Giza from 40 acres of empty desert. It was here that Lena and his team began their excavations. This large stone wall is called the Wall of the Crow in Arabic. 
and it's played a major part in our thinking about where we're excavating. Our site is just to the south. Anywhere else in the world, and this would be a national treasure, actually it's been somewhat ignored here at Giza because it's dwarfed by the pyramids and the Sphinx. It's much bigger than you think. It actually, our trenches up against the wall shows that it is some 10 meters, 30 feet tall. And this gateway behind me, therefore, is about 21 feet tall, maybe one of the largest gates in the ancient world. In 1991, they dug a trench, exposing thousands of pieces of pottery from the time of the pyramids. The pottery came from two rooms he believes were ancient bakeries. Several pots contained what looked like grain. To find out, he turned it over to archaeobotanists like Mary Ann Murray. In a flotation tank, the dirt falls to the bottom. What's left is vegetation. Later analysis confirmed it was wheat, possibly used for baking bread. The bakeries were attached to the back of a much larger mud brick building enclosed by a five foot thick wall. Inside were curious low benches and troughs, beautifully paved with desert clay. Lena and his team were baffled until they took a closer look at the dirt on the floor. Scraping that back, sometimes with Swiss army knives, we found these fibrous deposits, very fragile, that turned out to be the gills, fins, cranial parts, vertebrae of fish. Looking at some of the dirt filling the troughs under a microscope, it was filled with fish bones scattered throughout. So we seem to have inside the enclosure of the mud brick building a facility for processing fish. It soon became evident that Lena and his team had stumbled upon the kitchens that fed the pyramid builders. A short distance away, an ancient cemetery bears witness to the legions of craftsmen and laborers who stayed on to serve the dead kings. Built of stone left over from the pyramids, some are miniature mastabas with tiny courtyards and false doors bearing inscriptions of the owner's name. Others are simple graves topped with domes a crude reflection of a pyramid. But all are resurrection machines. Zahi Hawass, director of the Giza pyramids, has been excavating the ancient cemetery of the workmen. From the engraved walls of one of the more interesting tombs, we can learn a little bit more about the lives of these once unknown people. This man, his name is Nefertith. He married to two wives, and I believe it's very rare they lived with him in the same time. He had something like 11 children. But what's interesting, that his wife, his main wife, had a title in her graphic called Yen At. She was doing weaving. And underneath the false door, we have a very interesting scene that never occurred in any tomb before. This man is making wine, and this man is making beer. Even in the offering table here, they're talking about four types of wine and five types of beer. Because the common diet for a workman and a king in ancient Egypt were drinking beer and eating bread. I really believe that this man, Nefertith, once was in charge of the bakery located to the east of the tombs of the workmen. So far, some 600 tombs have been discovered. It now appears that the Wall of the Crows was the barrier that separated the hallowed ground of the pyramids from the mundane world of those who built them. It's estimated 20,000 Egyptians were drafted to erect just one pyramid at Giza. In the years to come, nothing quite like them would ever be seen again. Time would not be so kind to Egypt's next dynasty of kings. 
These ruined tombs are called the Forgotten Pyramids. Located not far from south of Giza at a site called Abu Sir, they are smaller than their colossal predecessors and in poor condition. Their limestone casings stripped in Roman times. In 1893, local farmers digging among some pyramids stumbled upon over 300 fragments of papyrus. Because they were difficult to read, the fragments were dispersed and forgotten. Then, in 1976, one caught the attention of archaeologist Miroslav Werner, director of the Czech mission exploring Abu Sir. It mentioned the mortuary temple of a little-known king named Raneferev, whose tomb had never been found. Werner suspected it lay under tons of sand near an unfinished pyramid. Because the pyramid was incomplete, early archaeologists assumed it had never been used, but they were wrong. At its base, Werner found a once fully operational mortuary temple, complete with the largest cache of 5th dynasty sculpture in existence, including a rare painted limestone statue of the king, his head shielded by his protector, the falcon god Horus. The pyramid complex was excavated in several uh, previous seasons, and we are at present digging in the core of the pyramid, uh, where we succeeded in discovering the entrance to the funerary apartment of Ranefere. We can expect, on the basis of what we have already found here in this area, in uh, remains of the burial equipment of the king, possibly also fragments of his red granite sarcophagus, and who knows? maybe even remains of his mummy. If Renéferev's mummy is found, this once forgotten king will reign as the only old kingdom pharaoh to survive intact in his tomb. Renéferev probably died in his 20s before his pyramid was finished. But the practical business of resurrection took place in the mortuary temple. Its importance was confirmed by Werner's next and most significant discovery, an archive of rare documents describing the activities of the king's cult. From the papyri found in this place, we have learned that the mortuary temple of Raneferev was a thriving religious center for at least 200 years after the king's death. About 200 priests, divided in five shifts, maintained the cult of the dead king by day and by night. By day they brought daily offerings consisting of bread, beer, meat, vegetables, fruit, etc. By night some priests watched from the temple terrace the stars and kept the records. The records from Abu Sir reveal a bureaucracy obsessed with detail. Meticulous inventories were kept of furnishings and cult objects, along with stockpiles and deliveries of food, and revenues collected from the king's estates. Duty rosters of priests charged with performing the daily rituals. Assignments included reviving the king's spirit, clothing his statue, and laying out sumptuous meals on the altars. What the king didn't eat, the priests did. According to one document, 130 bulls were slaughtered during one 10-day festival, all to honor a short-lived king. Ranefereff's cult flourished for 200 years before it was finally abandoned and his tomb forgotten. Centuries later, the great resurrection machines would vanish from the Egyptian landscape, only to reappear in a very different form.
In 1500 BC, the pharaoh Tutmosi I instructed his architect named Ineni to build him a tomb. On the west bank of the Nile, opposite Thebes, Egypt's most important religious center, he found the perfect spot, an isolated canyon dominated by a huge pyramid-shaped mountain called the Kurun. Here, deep in the rock, Ineni carved out his tomb. Certain the body of his pharaoh would be secure, he left a touching inscription on the walls of his own tomb a few miles away. It reads, I built the tomb of my majesty, no one seeing, no one hearing. Nearly 30 pharaohs would eventually be buried in what is now known as the Valley of the Kings. Immortality was assured by a stunning array of texts decorating the walls. While the Egyptians went underground, the pyramid would make a dramatic reappearance in another ancient but little known kingdom. Hidden away in Nubia, in modern-day Sudan, is one of history's best-kept secrets. These pyramids are the relics of a once powerful civilization known as the Kingdom of Kush. The story of why they were built begins around 1400 BC. For centuries, Egypt had coveted the wealth of Nubia. The Kushites controlled vast resources of gold and other minerals. They also dominated the principal trade routes to the heart of Africa. In the reign of Tutmose III, Egypt finally conquered Nubia, and the Kingdom of Kush became part of Egypt. 700 years later, the Kushite rulers in turn laid claim to Egypt's throne. Their claim centered around a flat-topped mountain in Nubia called Jebel Bakal. The mountain fascinated the Egyptians. On its western flank, the shape of a strange pinnacle led them to believe it was sacred. American archaeologist Tim Kendall of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts, has spent years unraveling the secrets of Jebel Bakal. When the Egyptians came here, they saw in this strange rock formation uh, the image of, of a very familiar symbol to them, a, a rearing cobra, which was uh, a, called a uraeus, the symbol of kingship, which the kings wore on their crown. The cobra form seems to be wearing the white crown of the south, which symbolized kingship over the south. The symbolism of the cobra and the white crown marked the presence at Jebel Barkal of Amun-Ra, Egypt's most important god, whose main home was in the temple of Karnak at Thebes. A form of Amun-Ra with a ram's head was believed to live inside the rock. His presence conferred kingship over all the Nile Valley, including Nubia. To honor Amun-Ra, the Kushite kings built a temple within the rock and decorated one wall with a depiction of the sacred mountain and the all-powerful god. In this little temple built by Taharqa, the greatest of the Kushite rulers of Egypt, uh, we actually have a representation of Jebel Barkal. And here you see the, the cliff. The mountain's actually painted red-brown. And within the mountain sits the god, who's shown ram-headed. The Nubian Amun was always ram-headed. And here he's actually called Amun, 
Lord of the thrones of the two lands, who is in the pure mountain, which is the name of Jebel Barkal. And here you see the great uh, pinnacle represented as a rearing cobra, or a uraeus, uh, with a sun disk on its head. When you see the mountain from the west side, um, it, the pinnacle actually looks like this. It has a, an orb on its top, and if you're standing there shortly after sunrise, the sun appears to come right out of the, the pinnacle and perch right on the top. By 750 BC, Kushite rulers were considered legitimate pharaohs. Recognized as Egypt's 25th dynasty, five kings reigned for half a century, during which they donned Egyptian costumes and titles. They adopted Egyptian art and architecture and inaugurated a new era of pyramid building that would last for a thousand years and produce some 200 pyramids more than in all of Egypt. But Kushite pyramids had a style all their own. They are visibly smaller and steeper in angle than Egyptian pyramids, and their tops are flat. Their offering chapels look like miniature temples. But the biggest difference was how they were built. Egyptian kings constructed their own and were often buried inside them. When the Kushite kings died, they were buried underground and their pyramids erected over them. One of the most important pyramid fields is at Meroe. All the burial chambers were looted in antiquity, except for one the tomb of a queen named Amanashakete. Here, in the last century, an Italian adventurer, Giuseppe Ferlini, discovered a fabulous cache of gold jewelry. The find triggered a wave of treasure hunting, during which the pyramids were systematically vandalized and some almost totally destroyed. The last pyramid ever built on the African continent was erected four centuries after the birth of Christ. Today, it's a heap of rubble. Still, the landscape of Meroe is a vivid reminder of a tradition that survived for 3,000 years and gave the world its most enduring symbol of the ancient past.